Hey, my name is Gustavo Flores Macias. I'm the director of the Latin American Studies Program. Um, I believe we have an attendance sheet somewhere um, that if you have, I would, we would really appreciate if you, if you um, sign in so that we can uh, continue with the, the funding of these, uh, of the seminar series and these events in general. Um, there's some food in the back um, and some drinks over there as well. And um, at the very end, I would just ask for you to help us leave the room the way we found it, just uh, throwing everything away. Uh, we would appreciate that. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Ryan, who will introduce our speaker for today. Thanks, Chicago, um, and introducing another Gustavo, uh, who graduated from Cornell University. He is the director of Brazilian uh, Institute for Brazilian Studies at Center for Brazilian Studies, sorry, at uh, Columbia University. And he has done research in both Venezuela and Brazil, um, with the majority of the research he in Brazil, I understand, yeah. in the Amazon. Um, wide ranging topics, but centering around um, issues of sustainable development, political policy, sustainable development, and uh, ethnobotanical research with indigenous communities, again, both in Brazil and Venezuela. And I guess we'll just leave it at that and look forward to talk. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Gustavo, Brian, Rebecca, for inviting me here. Glad to be here. Uh, it's been a while since I've been in and it's great to be back here. Um, so, uh, I'm gonna so I'm going to talk today about um, this is actually part of this is based on my dissertation work that I did here at, at Cornell a while back. Uh, and I worked with uh, Terry Turner, I worked with Max Pfeffer, uh, both in the kind of biology department. Eloy Rodriguez was being an informal mentor of mine while I was here. Um, and so this is work that I did for dissertation work and I've sort of recently kind of returned to the field and sort of been revising and updating my work with the goal of producing a, a book project on this. Um, so just a, a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some general stuff about socio-environmental politics in Brazil and talk about the history of the Discovery Coast, which is a portion of Southern Bahia where I've done my research. Uh, then the bulk of my talk will focus on uh, Akashaw Indians, uh, environmental governance, sustainable development in this region. Uh, and then I'll kind of circle back. Then I'll circle back to uh, sort of some big picture questions about Brazil and sort of what's going on in terms of, of, of sustainable development and participation of traditional peoples. Um, so just to start out just briefly, background. Uh, so the 1980s and early 1990s were really a formative period in uh, social environmental politics in Brazil. Uh, a lot of important policies and institutions were established, and there was a strengthening of, of role of civil society and its role in environmental governance. So a few, a few important things are you know, the creation of, of the New Brisbane Constitution in the late 1880s. The 1992 Rio Summit was a really pivotal moment in the environmental movement globally, but also in Brazil. Uh, in particularly, it brought together uh, international and local advocates, and also brought environmental movements and uh, indigenous and traditional people's rights movements together around a, a, a conjoined platform. Uh, so, following this, so a few, a few of the sort of major developments in this area era, and it starts starts kind of late eighties, early nineteen nineties, and kind of develops from there. So you have this, like I said, this consolidation of the social environmental approach, of uh, where social and environmental issues are addressed in a conjoined manner. Uh, you have the strengthening of um, legitimacy of conservation uh, and uh, granting of, of rights to indigenous people, but also other sorts of traditional peoples like um, rubber tappers, uh, Kilombola communities. You have this, this, this initial shift away from this idea of people free parks approach, so this idea of like fortress conservation, where you keep local people out and you sort of set aside land just for conservation. So this revision of, of a kind of a, a different kind of vision of how, it, how to go about doing conservation. Uh, like I said, there's an internationalization of uh, local struggles and this shift towards increasing participation of social movements in civil society. Um, a lot of this starts to really kind of pick up pace during Fernando uh, Cardoso's uh, when he was president, uh, and then kind of developed further under Lula. Uh, with Lula, I think one of the major changes was, was this kind of focus more on participation, right? And this is not just in the environmental arena, but, but across the board. Uh, you have these kind of formal institutions created for participation of civil society groups, and you have um, also a lot of social movement actors move into government roles. Uh, the initial uh, 
Manila takes over, uh, including, importantly, uh, Marina Silva, who becomes the, the Minister of the Environment, and she is somebody that comes from the Robert Tapper's movement and has this very kind of social environmental consciousness. Uh, so she really pushes this agenda of sort of seeing the environment in social terms uh, and promotes this kind of participation. She also promotes kind of transversality, so connections between environmental ministries and other ministries, the idea that you can't address environmental issues without addressing uh, broader economic development issues and uh, connecting with other aspects of government. So, but towards the end of Lula's, uh, Lula's second, uh, his, his second uh, time in, 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 uh, as president, you start seeing an increasing shift, uh, which became more and more problematic from an environmental and social standpoint. So there's this, this uh, pro the growth acceleration program is kind of emblematic of this. It's kind of emphasis on on large scale development projects, uh, hydroelectric dams being one of them. You know, these are, are plans that were kind of dusted off in the military dictatorship era and sort of reintroduced. Um, you have these processes going on, and and the, the sort of the participatory nature that's supposed to happen you know, in terms of environmental licensing and all that stuff is kind of pushed aside. So the government is kind of pushing these big, big scale projects uh, and really kind of ignoring local people's rights and interests selectively. Uh, so this, this starts happening under Lula. Uh, Juma is a big part of this, and sh this kind of intensifies under Juma. Um, so what you have is, uh, you know, Extreme dissatisfaction amongst people in social and in, in environmental movements uh, and indigenous rights, traditional people's rights, with uh, Juma and the government. Uh, and a few, these are just a few of the kind of major <coughs> focal points of contention, right? The, the hydroelectric stuff, um, Rio's participation and hosting of Rio Plus Twenty was seen as uh, as kind of a failure by many advocates. Uh, and then the revision of the forest code. So in 2012, a new forest code was passed, which essentially inf was the product of the influence of the Bancada Uralista, so the Rural Caucus, who has a lot of influence in Congress. Uh, and they basically diluted the forest code and, and, and uh, created a more flexible code which undermined uh, you know, environmental goals and rights of, of local peoples. So, in addition, you have all these other things happening in recent years. So, there's a slowing down of conservation units in traditional territories. You know, it really picked up under. Uh, Cardozo and Lula kept on kept on going, and now it's sort of like stagnated. Uh, even there's even uh, you know boundaries have actually shrunk in some cases, which is kind of unprecedented. Uh, and many proposed conservation units in traditional territories remain kind of in legal limbo. Uh, with this, you have intensified land conflict and rural violence in, in the last few years. Uh, and then sort of the most worrisome. Uh, Manifestation of this is this new. Uh, there's a new uh, constitution amendment being proposed, which would essentially transfer the rights to declare indigenous territories to Congress rather than the presidency. And given the power and influence of the rural caucus, this is very, very troubling. So now we'll move on to that. This sort of a big picture uh, view of what's going on in Brazil at the national level. I want to talk about uh, uh, the Discovery Coast of, of Bahia. So. Uh, the Discovery Coast is uh, in southern Bahia, down here, centered around the, the municipality of Porto Seguro, which is where Brazil was, was first discovered by the Portuguese. Uh, and it recently was uh, uh, sort of rebranded as Discovery Coast as a part of a sort of tourist development uh, where th this entire area is kind of referred to. It's four municipalities, but I'm going to really focus on the municipality of Porto Seguro, where, where most of my work is. Uh, and so within this municipality, there's several indigenous communities, uh, most of them concentrated around here. And this over here is a, a, the Monte Pascual National Park. So it's a, it's a national park that's uh, you know, created to preserve natural flora and fauna, but also an important sort of historical marker as, as the place where Brazil was discovered. So I'm going to very rapidly resume a long history <laughs> of the region. But essentially, this is a region, coastal Brazil is the most you know, heavily populated part of Brazil, but this is one of the regions that was the least populated and least development, de developed for, for a long time, and really doesn't take off until like the 1950s. Uh, so for much of, of its history, there was actually a strong indigenous presence in the area. Um, there was, you know, failed attempts to colonize, create uh, sugar plantations early on. Um, those kind of, those plans failed, and then in the, in the 19, in the 1700s, what happened was 
the mining boom came and gold and diamonds were found in Minas Gerais, and that was a big focus of the Portuguese colony. And the Portuguese, in order to control uh, mining, they required that all of that kind of get funneled down through a port in Barachi in Rio de Janeiro. So they consciously uh, decided not to allow colonization in this area of Brazil. So that meant uh, that the indigenous presence was very strong up until the early 1800s. Um, in, the, in the early to mid 1800s, there's this kind of war declared on the indigenous groups, and they sort of tried to exterminate or settle them into, uh, into um, missionary settlements. So in 1861, there's, there's this village created uh, right about here, which is, is would eventually become what, what is the, the Papa Shaw uh, communities of today. It's actually probably it was a mixture of different ethnicities that were kind of forced to settle together, uh, but it's kind of recognized as Papa Shaw as being the sort of the, the main ethnicity. So, like I said, but you, you know, even into, into the early 1900s, there was not a lot of a lot of development in this region. Uh, sparsely populated, not a lot of economic activities. Uh, and things start to change around the 1950s. Uh, in 1943, they created the, the Montepasqual National Park. Uh, it was really just on paper for a while, and then in the 1960s is when they actually tried to enforce the boundaries, and at that time they kicked the Batasha out of that were inhabiting the area. And this was a, kind of a critical moment in the development of the region. So here you see kind of forest cover and how it changed over time. So up until 1945, there was, there was heavy forest cover. But then with the construction of a road, which was completed in 1973, you see, especially in the 1960s, uh, um, drastic transformation, right? Uh, most this is kind of like logging, charcoal production, but then it's transformed into pasture land. Uh, so, and this coincided with the time when they decided to establish the, the boundaries of the park uh, and when the Patasha were, were expelled. So what ended up happening is, even though they were expelled, slowly they started coming back to this area. Um, it, was, it was, you know, hard to reach and one of the areas where there was still kind of forest and areas where they could uh, cultivate and do an, engage in extractive activities. So what ended up happening is they, they settled uh, near the park, uh, and they had a contentious relationship with uh, the park service folks. Um, Funa, Funai came to the area, sort of like recognized them as an indigenous group, as an indigenous group, and then they sort of tried to mediate the relationship with the park service. They came to this resolution, which was, uh, you know, in 1981, they created, they cut off part of the park uh, and made it into an indigenous reservation. Uh, the thing is, it, it actually is, the boundaries are, are superimposed, so the, they never actually revised the boundaries of the park, so the, the reservation is actually inside a national park, which creates all sorts of legal troubles. Um, but the important thing I'll say here is that, you know, this was, they were given this parcel of land, but it's kind of the worst part of land, parcel of land for agriculture. Uh, the soils are really poor, uh, and they got also were cut off from the mangroves, which were a very important source of food for them. Um, so, needless to say, the Batasha were, were never quite happy with this, but, but the creation of the reservation brought other Batasha from the region back to, back to this area. So just a few, a few comments on what's kind of going on in the region during this time. So, you have this, this rapid development of the area in the 1980s and 2000s, to, to the 2000s. There's a population growth, urbanization. Um, there's this new economic activities that emerge, a cattle ranching still important, some sort of commercial agriculture, uh, and then you have uh, paper pulp production, so the plantation of eucalyptus to produce paper pulp, uh, and tourism becomes very, very important. Uh, so with this you have, you know, the issue of land concentration was exacerbated, um, and you also have the expansion of conservation units, uh, which might seem a little bit kind of counterintuitive that you have both these things going on, but I think Tourism is a really important factor here uh, in kind of pushing uh, uh, an attention to conservation in a way that didn't exist before. And you also have, this is at a time, as I mentioned before, when environmental politics nationally kind of gave more attention to conservation units and that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't need to go in, in, into detail here, but just 
show that there's, there's this creation of a lot of sort of local environmental institutions, uh, new parks were created, uh, uh, you have the creation of a municipal secretary of the environment, um, uh, and so that there, there was a lot of transformation going on in terms of environmental governance of the region. Uh, also important to note is that this is a time when um, Brazil was about to celebrate its 500 years of discovery. And so there was a lot of activity directed at this region at the time. So there was a big push for, for development, uh, tourism, uh, and so just a few brief, brief notes about so what, what did the Patashua do? How did they subsist? Um, so there's three, there's lots, there's lots of small communities, but there's three major communities, Baja Velha, Boca da Mata and Curo Vermelha. This one I'm not going to talk about too much, but it's a, a kind of urban settlement that really caters to, they, they make their lives in the, off selling things to tourists, mm -hmm. uh, primarily crafts. Uh, this is the kind of original community. Uh, like I said, it's not the best place for agriculture. Uh, and they're kind of closer to tourist circuits. So they do some commercialization of things for tourists, uh, but also do some engage in some agriculture and extractive activities. And then you have Boca da Mata, which uh, is a community that's most heavily involved. It's the most isolated community, uh, but it's the one that's kind of more heavily involved in agriculture, and it's also one that's most heavily involved in craft production. And as you'll see, it's, it's right near the, the parts of the park that have a lot more forest cover. Um, so some of the things they do, agriculture, kind of manioc production, things that are kind of common in, in rural Brazil, uh, beans, they engage in a variety of extractive activities, and then craft production. Craft production was actually introduced by Funai back when they didn't have land for, for agriculture um, as, a, as an economic alternative. As tourism has grown, uh, this has become more and more important, and sort of what they produce is diversified. So you usually it started out with just bead necklaces and then sort of uh, evolved into kind of production of wood crafts, and, and at, at its most sort of industrial form of production of these uh, wood crafts with, with uh, mechanized tools. So with that development, the, 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 issues, the, the, the issues between the Batasho and the Park Service, which had always been there, kind of started intensifying. Uh, they were going into the parks, taking wood, there were some incidences of forest fires, there's discussion of who created, who, who made this, who put those forest fires and who's to blame for that. And they say that this sort of relationship kept on, uh, <coughs> this tension continuously intensified. So in 1999, the Bata Shoda said, we're going to take over the park and declare our own. Um, now, an important point here is that the immediate motivation for doing this was that they, they had been trying to negotiate with Bama to do some sort of co-management plan. And like I said, at the national level, there's this big push for revising the way we think about conservation. Um, and, but at the local level, it was still this kind of fortress model of conservation. And the Bata were trying to create some sort of uh, more collaborative relationship with the Park Service, and it went nowhere. So <clears throat> they took over the park, and after that they were able to broker some sort of <coughs> an attempt at, an initial attempt at co-managing the park uh, between Obama, Park Service, and Brunei, and Papa Shaw. So this, this project, it wasn't, it wasn't a total, total failure, but it sort of was marred uh, by a lot of issues. So there was a lack of participation in the early stages of the design of the project. The project was created by the environmental ministry and was kind of very sort of top down. Um, so the, the primary goal was conservation of forests. Um, and so Bata Shaw's interest in sort of creating alter economic alternatives and that sort of thing were kind of marginalized in this process. Um, you also had, you know, these are very heterogeneous com communities, people engaged different different economic activities, some people more involved in agriculture, some people more involved in craft production, uh, and there's a lot of tensions about, about this project. Uh, and including some factions within the Bata Shah were just adamant that we shouldn't collaborate with Obama because this was just an attempt to sort of co-op them and undermine their land claims. So, Now I'm going to turn to, to sort of talking about the kind of most recent kind of developments. And here I'm using, I'm not crazy about the term post-neoliberal, but I think it just kind of encapsulates uh, some changes that occurred 
um, from you know with with the rise of PT to power in in, in Brazil. Um, so during this time, uh, again, tourism continues to be important and continues to grow. Uh, not only tourism, but also kind of real estate speculation, people buying sort of summer homes and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of development, especially along the coastal area. Um, and keep in mind, this is also a time period when sort of the Brazilian middle class has expanded, right? And so more people are able to, the people that weren't previously able to afford tourism uh, are able to. So, so there's a, the tourism industry was growing in the area. This is a very popular destination, relatively cheap to get to if you're in Brazil. Um, so this expanded enormously, but also uh, eucalyptus plant production expanded quite significantly. Now, spatially, these ideas are a little bit separated, so that the eucalyptus production is more inland, uh, but really a vast expansion in the area under cultivation for eucalyptus. Um, the, the environmental implications of it are kind of complicated, they're sort of contradictory uh, takes on if this is good or bad. You know, it's, most of it is replacing uh, cattle pasture, so in some ways it's a positive development, but there are other reasons why eucalyptus is bad for the environment in terms of like uh, uh, water cycles and other sorts of things. Uh, but so this, this had been expanding for quite some time, but in 2005 they, they built a, a large factory, uh, it's not here on the map, but somewhere over here, uh, to greatly increase the demand for eucalyptus. And so this is, this is something that um, it's, it's become an important industry in Brazil, uh, very important locally. Uh, it's something that, you know, for sort of producing like paper pulp, toilet paper, that sort of thing. A lot of it uh, primarily produced for export. You know, China is a big consumer of, of, of products created from this. So, I don't want to go into all the detail here, but, but what I want to highlight here is, is this idea that, you know, as I mentioned, there's just been overall trend towards strengthening environmental governance, environmental institutions at, at the national level, but also at the local level. So you have creation of local laws, like the laws of you know, which is uh, basically laws for like licensing, uh, for if you want to build something, build a factory, build housing. Uh, you have to go through environmental licensing. Um, and only in 2005 was this created at the local level. Part of, the, part of what's going on here is, is there's, there's an increasing decentralization of these, of these responsibilities that used to be centralized at the federal government. Uh, you have um, Obama, uh, the, the Ministry of Environment sort of reorganized itself, and so now parks are under the control of, of this new institution, Instituto Chico Mendes, uh, which was created under, under Marina Silva, and kind of had this different view of conservation from Obama, so it's a more kind of uh, a more expansive view of conservation that, that takes the social questions a bit more seriously. Uh, but still, the, the primary goal is, is you know, conservation, uh, protection of conservation units. Um, you also have lots of new opportunities for formal participation in environmental de decision making at, at the national level, at the state level, at the municipal level. So there's you know, councils and things tied to specific conservation units, to specific issues, like watersheds, uh, specific parks, um, where there's opportunities for civil society participation. And like I said, at, at the local level, I think the fact that tourism is really important is, is, is an important driving factor here, because if you, if you compare Port Segura to other, other municipalities in the region, their environmental institutions aren't as robust. Um, so, so during during this sort of neoliberal, post neoliberal era, you also have some fairly radical changes to Akasha communities and just rural communities in general. So, uh, so you've expanded access to public goods and services, new economic activities, uh, employment opportunities. You also have an increased uh, socioeconomic, socioeconomic differentiation and stratification within communities. Uh, the persistence of tensions over land rights is an important issue here at the local level. And you also have increased political participation in organization, uh, including you know, the environmental uh, institutions that I mentioned before, but also in the broad. 
So just a few examples of, of some of the, the major changes. So education is much stronger uh, before uh, Batasha had to leave the community if they wanted to go to high school, uh, which is a huge barrier for to pursue education. Uh, not all schools, not, not all communities had, had schools. So th there's been a, a considerable expansion of educational opportunities, this, not just in these communities, but in Brazil overall, in a fairly radical transformation. I mean, the quality is still not great, but, but over the last 10, 15 years, significant changes. Uh, public health was improved. Uh, there's not all communities have electricity and sanitation, but most of them didn't have any before, and, and a lot of communities, especially the bigger ones, have that now. Um, you have uh, new housing, government housing, or housing that's sort of uh, made available through sort of low interest mortgages. Uh, you have cash transfer program, both familia that many of you are familiar with Brazil are familiar with that. Uh, the extension of rural pension benefits, uh, which is a uh, very important impact on on these communities. Um, you know, keep in mind we're talking about subsistence communities whose whose sort of economic uh, activities are very tied to uh, you know growing seasons, uh, things that are tied to tourism are tied to the tourism cycle. Uh, so these kinds of uh, sources of of income are really important because they're, they're also they're kind of year-round consistent, even if they're not huge amounts of money, that they are very significant in the context of the local economy. Uh, and you also have the expansion of access to credit, so for, for agriculture and for other activities. Uh, so in terms of new economic activities, uh, lots of new government jobs. So more and more Pantasho have employment with the with the state, uh, including uh, most most importantly uh, in education, so it's teachers in the communities. Uh, very important. Like I said, this is a, a consistent source of income that's very significant in local economy. Uh, and also has, has economic implications, but also political implications. So uh, the teachers come become, uh, oftentimes are leaders within the communities, uh, and have a lot of influence there, but people that kind of mediate between communities and outside, and outside agencies. Um, and it also transformed the nature of leadership a little bit. So you have younger leadership, you also have more women in leadership roles. Uh, it did, didn't undo with kind of the more traditional forms of leadership, but it kind of creates a more complex landscape of, of leadership. Um, you have uh, more folks engaged in, you know, service sector employment, so working as tourist guides, working in restaurants, uh, you know, and this is all, all tied to the tourism industry, uh, or primarily tied to the tourism industry. And then you also have new sorts of economic opportunities emerging, so people starting uh, their own sort of small businesses. Um, for example, some, some that have been doing quite well in the communities, they, they drive these dune buggies, they're kind of like a taxi service that shows people from, from different sort of tourist, settle, tourist towns uh, through the beaches. Uh, these are, you know, people get got money from the Brazilian Development Bank loans so that they can buy these, these dune buggies and they pay back their loans, but um, it's, been, it's, it's a considerable source of income. Uh, and then there's sort of new market-oriented oriented cultivation and extractive activities like uh, production of blue boom, uh, which is, you know, it's like a traditional dye spice, but there's there's a factory in the region and so they've been buying, they've been cultivating a lot of this and selling it. So, what I want to highlight here is, is, is the issue that, you know, the inclusion through all these sorts of things like home employment, electricity, housing, also familia, pensions, uh, have brought the Bata Shark more, uh, more into a sort of consumer economy. And that's sort of ambiguous implications, right? So there's, 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 most of the changes are welcomed by the communities. I mean, they're happy to have electricity, they're happy to have better schools and stuff. Um, but it's also, um, it also adds new costs. So, you know, if you, now you have more kids going to school, you gotta pay for school supplies. You have electricity, you gotta pay your electricity bills. If you're taking out uh, government loans for housing or for small businesses, these are, these are added economic burdens on communities. Um, and so while most, most Patasha have benefited in some respects from this, there's also, it's also important to say that, you know, these are fairly modest, you know, when, when you look at the big context, you know, like Los Familia, it's a very small amount of money, right? Significant in the local context, but it's still uh, not a huge influx of, of income. Um, and some, a lot of these benefits are unevenly distributed. Specifically thinking of like the, the employment opportunities, right? So there's people working for the uh, 
in health and education, uh, but these these opportunities are limited, uh, and these these folks have, you know, this acquired this kind of tremendous political and economic power in these communities where a lot of a lot of folks are still uh, primarily engaged in subsistence activities. As I said, the persistence of, ten, ten, of, of tension over land rights continues to be really important here. So um, there's been a, a lengthy and ongoing process of kind of redefining the boundaries of the, of the Plata Shaw Reservation. There, there's several reservations, but the one I'm talking about specifically here is the, the, the one that's superimposed with the, the park. Um, there, a sort of FUNAI finalized its report in 2008. Um, and it includes all the park area, it includes uh, you know, uh, MST settlements, it includes commercial farmland, eucalyptus plantations, cattle ranches, and it includes some um, tourist establishments as well. So needless to say that this, to put this into practice is gonna be kind of very complicated. There's lots of opposition to this from, from various sorts of people with, with local influence. Mm -hmm. um, now, this has been sitting for eight years at the Ministry of Justice and nothing has really happened. Nothing has advanced on this. So uh, while well, in 2008 the Patashore were, were delighted to have you know, the, 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 the proposed new territory defined, uh, they've been, this thing has been languishing uh, in the federal government for eight years. So in terms of political participation, so one of the important things that's going on in these communities also is increasing engagement with government. Uh, you know, historically, their one connection to government was through FUNAI. Uh, FUNAI has been reformulated. Uh, it lost a lot of its responsibilities. It's sort of been disempowered in a lot of ways. Uh, and then you also have this, this general trend towards decentralizing things in all areas of government, from the federal level to the state and municipal level. So what, what this has meant is instead of one leader uh, connecting through government, through through FUNAI, the local FUNAI office, they have to deal with all these different uh, government institutions. Uh, you know, from education, public health, uh, the environmental institutions, uh, which has really kind of transformed kind of Pakistani uh, politics in different ways. Uh, there's also more uh, organization within the communities and across communities. So various villages creating sort of like umbrella organizations that. Uh, Kind of advocate and work for collective interests. Um, these include just among the Pakasha, but also at wider scales, so uh, all southern Bahian indigenous groups, and they're also participating in sort of national uh, and, and sort of northeastern indigenous groups. So, in terms of those are some of the sort of general trends in, in, in political participation, but that you know what's most important here from, from my talk is. is participation in environmental governance. Um, so you have uh, lots of new uh, environmental institutions, a uh, few that I've mentioned before, but these are just some of the examples of, you know, the Batashaw don't participate in all of them, but they do participate in several of them. So there's an extractive reserve for fishing, uh, they participate in the municipal council, municipal environmental council, um, this forum for the style, which is actually, it was created by the Euclid's companies as, as a kind of forum for debating issues about, uh, you know, forestry in the region. Um, and other sorts, this is a, another conservation unit. And just an example, so this is the, the Municipal Environmental Council. Uh, you know, that these councils, if you're familiar with them, they usually have, you know, have to have government representation, uh, private sector participation and organized civil so civil society. So, for Port Seguro Municipal Council, you have a. Um, just wanted to highlight a few things here. You have uh, this Eco Tourism Association of Patasha. Um, it's actually from from a, there's Patasha participation, but it's from a very small community with its own peculiarities. Uh, you don't have representation of any of the larger communities here, uh, which presents some problems. Uh, but also important to note that you know there's heavy private sector participation, and again you see things attached to tourism and the Apuso Lazi, which is the the of this company. In addition to sort of participating in these sort of formal channels, uh, you also have an increasing number of projects 
involving the Pata Shah you know, for conservation and environmental management. Um, so this is a laundry list of, of a laundry list of, of different projects. Uh, there, there's more than this actually, but um, just to get, give you a sense of that there's this kind of like explosion of these participatory projects happening in the region since since that first somewhat failed attempt in 2002. Um, but during, during this process, you have Bakasha participating more in, in environmental projects. There's also an improvement in the relationship, in, in general, an improvement in the relationship between uh, environmental agencies and the Bakasha, so there's a little bit more of a collaborative relationship over time. Um, the, and all, all these projects have their own sort of unique dynamics depending on who the funders are, who the partners are, but you know, they usually involve somebody from government, usually involve NGOs, sometimes private sector. Uh, there's funding from the Food and Agriculture Organization, UNESCO, from Ger German uh, Development Organization, from Conservation International. And each of those have, have their own sort of, each project has its own unique objectives and, and sort of dynamic. Uh, the, the, the two that I, I think are most significant that I just want to point out is the, the Territorial Management Plan of the Bakasho Territory um, and the Municipal Conservation Plan. Um, which the Bakasha participated in. Um, so this, the, the Bakasha Territorial Management Plan was kind of the most ambitious participatory project to date. Uh, it involves uh, ECMBO, so the, the Ministry of the Environment, and FUNAI. Um, FUNAI is, is kind of the main uh, institution driving this, which I think is an important point because it, it's different than that first attempt, uh, which was through Ibama. This you have Funai in the driving seat of uh, this, this uh, project. So it, it, while both projects have a sort of social environmental scope to them, uh, the balance is, is more on kind of the social side of this project. Um, so this, the, the sort of recommendations that come out of this plan are, are huge. I mean, they kind of touch on every single issue possible <laughs> in the Patashar communities. We just want to highlight a few things, you know, uh, providing training uh, and equipment and positions for Pakasha to, to work in conservation. So a lot of them, uh, they've sort of been helping police the park boundaries and stuff, but they're not really paid, with the exception of fire brigades. Um, they, <coughs> the issue of eucalyptus cultivation pops up again. Um, the, there's this call for a redefinition of the shared management plan between ECMB, Funai, and Bakasha with equal powers among the three segments. So even though there's, there's sort of this, this co-management of the park, uh, supposedly, the, in terms of within the park boundaries, the, the ECMB is, is, is kind of the lead on this. And so the Bakasha don't have a lot of liberty to sort of engage in, in decision making there. Um, well, like I said, while well, the relationship is better than it was in the past, because of the institutional changes, but also the changes in local representatives of ACMBO who are more collaborative, uh, there's still a lot of tensions there. Uh, and so, you know, not surprisingly, you see, you know, foreground in this plan, you know, the call for participation in the park council, the deliberative power, right? So they want actual, actual decision-making power, not just to be sort of consulted. Uh, and the effective indigenous participation and collaboration of the park management plan and incorporation of management plan and the shot and map in this plan. So again, this emphasis on you know even participation has improved at least from the shot perspective. They're still uh, not having the leadership role that they want. Um, another key thing to highlight in this in this in this plan. Sorry, this is in Portuguese, but the, the, the key point here is that uh, is the issue of. Uh, the land rights. So the plan says that, you know, without the resolution of the redefinition of the boundaries of park lands, all, all the themes raised in this are compromised. Right? Again, this is, as I mentioned, this has been kind of an ongoing issue, like from, from that first initial attempt at a participatory project, there were people that did not want to participate in it because they felt like this was going to compromise their, their land rights. Uh, and this still continues to be an issue. Um, if you don't know what your territory is going to be, uh, what sorts of resources you have available, how can you go ahead and plan for the management of the territory if you don't actually know what those boundaries are? 
and who's going to have decision making power within those boundaries. Um, so all of these these projects that they participate in have brought some benefits to them, but a lot of them are sort of still projects on paper. There's uh, not a lot of things that have concretely happened as a, as a result of this. Um, and there's a lot of off the shelf criticism of the fact that there's not, not usually not a lot of strong outcomes of <coughs> these projects. They feel like we, went, we spent all this time participating in this and to no end, really. Uh, but some of, some of the things that they've gotten out of this sort of developed some detailed resource mapping, you know, combining local knowledge with, with GIS. Uh, there's been uh, training capacity building and sort of, you know, fire management, uh, being an eco tourism guide. Um, other sorts of things related to, to management of the area, agriculture. Um, there are agricultural, some agricultural projects and support for inputs, you know, like fertilizers and things like that for a lot of these sort of newer uh, agricultural activities. So this has probably been the most concrete outcome. Um, and then some employment, uh, but this is, most of this employment is temporary. Uh, not kind of doesn't really give them a sustained source of income. They're either seasonal, the fire brigades, they can only do it for six months and then they have to give it to some give the position to somebody else. Uh, there's been some creation of these sort of reforest this reforestation group that has gotten some jobs working actually for eucalyptus companies to do reforesting in certain lands. Um, but again it's not it's not sustained employment. It's a few people here and there. Um, so I mean well the outcomes have been fairly limited um, in concrete terms. I think that there are some positive benefits in this in, 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 in a more in, indirect way, right? So I think it's, it's, it's really helped build their capacity to, to participate in environmental decision making. So they become much more familiar with technical language uh, and develop technical law, knowledge to sort of dialogue with, with environmental experts, which is a which is a big issue because a lot, a lot of environment, a lot of these sort of councils for participation uh, in Brazil, some of them have a more technical character and some have a less technical character. Envir environmental ones tend to be very technical. You have a lot of sort of experts, uh, and it can be difficult to dialogue with that if you don't have that background. Uh, they've better understood. They have a better understanding of public policy processes. They've also this is also important. They've expanded their personal networks. So as in, the more and more they participate in these, they make connections with people in NGOs, uh, government. Uh, that can lead to other sorts of projects uh, and other sorts of, and can help them in sort of advocacy efforts. Um, so, you know, it, to the point here that it's, you know, despite the, the limitations and issues, there, there's sort of, there's this creation of a sort of new sense of environmental subjectivity going on uh, that is important not just for environmental questions, but how, how they engage with government more broadly. Um, so, a few persistent challenges to participatory management. Uh, you know, I've, I've pointed out a few kind of specific issues, um, but I think it's important to point out that you know a lot of these councils they participate. Besides the, the projects, I'm talking now about the, the councils, uh, the numerous councils that they participate in. Um, so there's this increased number of uh, forms of participation, but they're often inactive. They don't meet regularly. Um, there's no, the decisions that come out of them are not sort of binding, they don't actually lead to anything concrete happening. Uh, and so, and there's also important barriers to their participation. So, you know, these are time consuming activities. Uh, they often have to, you know, dislocate, you know, three or four hours from a community to go participate in these meetings. Uh, it takes time away from, from family, from subsistence activities, so it's not, it's not everybody that can participate in this, and it, it, it creates certain barriers to kind of sustained engagement on these issues, uh, which may be different. So, like, for instance, you compare it with somebody from the private sector <coughs> who lives in Puerto Seguro uh, and is participating in environmental council, they can have a much more sustained, <coughs> constant engagement in, uh, in the council and with the Secretary of the Environment. Um, so I think some of the issues here, you know, are these practical barriers that I that I mentioned. Uh, there, there is, I would argue, always, always kind of a top-down element to these projects, right? There's not, you know, the funders or the government partners or NGO partners always have a, a specific agenda that they're pushing. 
uh, and often come, you know, as much as they, they even when they make a conscious effort to engage people early on in the project, there's always uh, some aspect of the agenda and the expected outcomes that is not driven by local interests. Um, the, the use of exclusionary scientific and technical language, I touched upon this before, you know, and I said, I think well, some of the Tata that are very engaged in these forums have developed that, the, that technical capacity more than in the past, but it's still an important barrier. So, uh, and, and it's often a reason to sort of ignore what they say during meetings, right? There's this kind of sense that um, they don't really know what they're talking about, or they're speaking a different language, uh, they don't really understand climate change, they don't really understand uh, conservation science. Um, there's the issue of, of you know, most of, most of these councils, uh, typically whatever decisions are made are often just recommendations, right? They're not necessarily something that the, the Secretary of the Environment is going to take up and act upon. Um, and then there's the, the issue of policy making silos and fragmentation of decision making spaces. And by, by this, what I'm talking about is, is you have these institutions for environment, participation in environmental governance, but they might not dialogue with other parts of government. So, um, so kind of big picture issues about economic development and that sort of thing might not dialogue with what's being said in these kinds of, in these kinds of spaces. Uh, and often to kind of supersede uh, the, the sort of decisions and input that come from these kinds of institutions. Um, and there's also a fragmentation of decision making spaces. As I showed you before, there's this huge proliferation of different sorts of uh, ways they can participate in environmental development. Uh, and oftentimes, these different institutes, something, there's a lot of, there are certain actors that are present in all of these. Uh, but they're often composed of slightly different groups, and there's not a lot of dialogue between these, even, even though they're dealing with overlapping issues, uh, overlapping areas. So, with, it, with this, I wanted to sort of return back to sort of the bigger picture of Brazil and what's going on and how this relates to, to what we see in, in, in the Discovery Coast. So, you know, despite this increased participation, uh, which is real, and like I said, that there are some, some actual benefits to it. Um, this participation has been so, so circumscribed and uneven due to uh, the uneven adoption of formal participation mechanisms at local levels. So like I said, these uh, you know, environmental, municipal environmental councils, for instance, which are probably one of the most important institutions of this sort, um, you know, municipalities are supposed to have these a while back. Some don't have them yet. Some have them only recently, uh, and others, for others, they're not very active. Um, you also have the issue of who participates, um, you know, which groups are participating. I, I showed you a list of, of, of who participates in Port Seguro. Uh, in some instances, you know, there's also differences in how people get elected to those positions. So they might be elected, they might be appointed. The, the Secretary of the Environment might actually like handpick who he wants in that. And so, um, even though in, in, in Port Seguro in general there's a, there's a kind of positive trend, if you look at other 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 municipalities, <coughs> things are a lot a lot more problematic. Um, so again, there's exclusion from important decision making spaces. Again, there's this lack of sort of transversality in government, where, where different ministries and secretaries are talking to each other. Uh, and there's certain ministry, you know, the, the, the minister, Ministry of Agriculture has a lot more power than the Ministry of the Environment. And, and so, and if there's no dialogue between those, uh, there might be sort of, kind of a, a conflicting agendas and interests that don't quite dialogue with each other. Um, and then, of course, there's a privilege access to decision makers among those with competing interests, right? So the folks from that are so lost, they can participate in these, these councils. Uh, but they have a, a lot stronger power to influence uh, environmental decision making and general aspects of economic development in the region that have an impact on environmental questions. Mm. And you see this, you know, this at, at the national level, right, with the hydroelectric dams, right, where you have, um, you know, environmental licensing laws just ignored, uh, inconvenient. 
And just just as, as a, a quick concrete example, in the case of the region, there's the Forum Forestal, uh, which I mentioned before, which was this sort of council to discuss forestry issues in the region. It was created by uh, the the eucalyptus company. Um, they initially no civil society actors wanted to participate in this because they saw it as blatant attempt to sort of co-opt people's interests. And, um, but over time, they were able to build some some interest and participation, including Papa Shaw. Uh, and the forum has, you know, it has resulted in some positive impact. It has been sort of responsive to civil society pressure and interests. Uh, you know, they changed some of the logging routes. Uh, they excluded certain areas for eucalyptus cultivation. Uh, there's a freeze in cultivation in some municipalities. Uh, but not, but another sort of radically transformed uh, the eucalyptus industry is really kind of getting in the way of, of, of what they want to do. Um, and as an example, this you know the, the state the state government just approved licenses for uh, the expansion of, of plantations, and there was no discussion with civil society groups. Uh, so this again, it's, it's I mean, it's, I mean the the issue of like hydroelectric dams is is quite distinct, but I think you see, see a similar process coming. So, you know, the efforts to promote economic inclusion and poverty alleviation that have occurred under the PT that, you know, the PT has widely promoted and a lot of people say is, you know, kind of really transformed Brazil and has had a really positive impact. I mean, there is, there is some truth to that, right? There is, it has empowered people politically and economically in important ways. Um, you know, also Familia is, is one of the ones that's talked about the most, but, but I think, uh, I think this, the, the, the rural pensions were very important. Uh, the access to education, I think, has been fairly transformative. Uh, again, despite the issues in quality that still exist. Um, but when we look at the, step back and kind of look at the big picture, uh, these are fairly modest efforts, right? Um, they've had uneven impacts throughout the country. Uh, and they've ultimately been undermined by the broader thrust of rural development policies and investments. So you see this with, you know, soy production areas. You see it with the dams. Uh, you see it with uh, the changing of the forest code. Um, and I think what's worrisome, especially in the particular in the moment that we're at now, is that you know things have been bad for some time, and I think they might just get worse. So I think um, the 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 gains, whatever gains that have occurred in terms of poverty alleviation and sort of increased participation might be undermined, particularly uh, with the changes you know, just happening as we speak. Uh, so, you know, the. So, the, the issue of. So, this kind of neo developmentalist approach that, that Brazil has taken in recent years. With the park and this kind of very sort of this kind of like state-driven capitalism that that is kind of taking hold um, is really you know Brazil kind of talks itself as a sort of champion of sustainable sustainable development, but really the kind of key issues, key environmental issues and social issues that are really part of at least my conception of sustainable development are not really given the attention in there. Right, the issue of, of equity uh, and environmental sustainability it's, it's very selective. Right? It's when it's convenient. Uh, you have strong centralization of economic decision making. Um, you have this growth that's based on the prioritization of a narrow set of commodities. You know, at the national level, you have like petroleum, uh, the dams, soy production. Here at the local level, uh, you have you know tourism and the eucalyptus industry. Um, you know, and and as some others have have argued, I think the emphasis when you look at this sort of process of social inclusion that has happened over recent years. The, the, the emphasis is more on them as sort of consumers and producers in the economy than as, as citizens, as active citizens, uh, that have a stronger influence on uh, on public policy. Uh, and this is something, you know, you know Brazil is a highly unequal place and continues to be one of the most unequal places in the world. Uh, and you see that reflected in terms of people's political power, uh, whether it's environmental issues or other issues. Um, you know, we see this, you know, the, the emphasis, you know, even though Brazil's quality has has increased slightly, 
over the last 10, 15 years, it's, it's a very small increase. Uh, and really the emphasis here has been more on poverty alleviation, so like Los Familia didn't really address inequality, really just kind of addressed the, the worst aspects of, of, of rural poverty. Um, and so you still have this very circumscribed political participation, right? And so, you know, with the Batasha, you know, you have this participation in some decision-making spaces, but when it comes to, for instance, their, their land rights, right? They have not, they've been constantly going to Brasilia advocating to, for action on this, and nothing happens, right? So, So to, to close, I just want to say, so, so although there's been, there's a lot of contradictory things going on in Brazil right now, uh, both at the local level and at the national level, and I think these things kind of reflect and feed upon each other. Um, but the, overall, there's, there, there's this, been a trend in Brazil towards an increased valorization of indigenous and traditional peoples with conservate, within conservation to understand the development discourses and practices. But this continues to have contradictory impulses and it produces the, the historical symmetries of power. Uh, so at the same time, it sort of provides a new valuation of indigenous people and environmental sustainability. Uh, their, their agency continues to be heavily circumscribed uh, in sort of the conception, development, and implementation of conservation and resource management efforts. So there's this, um, you know, there's this sort of opening up of participation in certain niches within Brazil, but also closing off in other, other instances at the same time. So that goes there.
Um, but I think in the, Brazil, it's it's is is very you know its swing to the left is fairly mild by regional standards. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about current economic crisis and the changes happening as we speak. I wonder kind of if you have any comments on how this affects what you're thinking about and if your center has any kind of more broad positions on current events and results. Um, I don't know if the center has a position. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I'm going to You know, well, I mean, our, our center is. You know, we're, we're more just a place to sort of promote dialogue and conversation about things. Um, so there's a wide variety of perspectives on, on the, the current political moment. You know, in Brazil, people are polarized, and so are sort of academics who study Brazil, right? Um, I think, you know, I think the current political moment is, is very worrisome. Um, you know, as you know, as you can see, I'm, I'm not necessarily. Highly supportive of Juma and the PT government. I think there's a lot of flaws, um, but I worry about the the way you know this the impeachment process is happening and, and what its possible repercussions are. You know, I think um, the the folks in Congress that are kind of taking the lead on the changes happening right now have strong ties to. Bancada Buralista is with the World Caucus, and so the, the very same people that have undermined uh, sort of in, environmental issues, have undermined indigenous rights issues, um, as of now seem like they're going to be more strongly empowered, and I think um, that is quite worrisome. So, um, my reading of your presentation is that it you know, there's a glass half full and a glass half empty here. And on the one hand, there's been progress, you know, compared to, I guess, you know, if you go way back when the, the show had their land and they were uh, displaced, and then there was some progress in making, having them return to their land and maybe become part of the community again. So there's some progress there, but at the same time, there's much to be done. And, you know, most of the activities that you describe as, as the economic activities that they're carrying out right now seem very, you know, there's not a whole, nobody, it's not, it's not, they're not terribly contributing to sustainability in a way, it's their own, their own, it's, it's, it's just basically getting by, right? If you're driving a doom vehicle to go from beach resort to beach resort, you know. Um, but, but in, you know, in any case, one could point to progress in, in the uh, mode of organization, governance, and so on. How typical is, is the Pataxo experience in Brazil compared to other indigenous groups? Um, I, think, well, I, I think some of the issues are across the board. You know, the <coughs> the land type issue is, is something that happens everywhere. But the Pataxo are a very peculiar group for, for many reasons. For um, one, you know, they don't have a Batasha language. I mean, they have some words, but they're not, you know, so that they're not sort of authentic Indians in the eyes of a lot of people. So that, that creates, something that I talk about, that that creates a different sort of dynamic to their efforts to pursue their rights, right? It's very easy to sort of delegitimate their, their, their rights at the local level or even national level. So that, that, that's an issue with them. The fact that they are in this area tourism, I think, is also pretty unique. I mean, you have some of that in parts of Amazonia, um, but on a much smaller scale, a different kind of tourism than we have here. So that, that creates a, a different sort of dynamic. Um, it's also, because this is not a more highly developed area, we're talking about um, the availability of land is more complicated. There's a lot more competing interests. I mean, obviously, there's other places in Brazil where you have similar issues. Um, but in general, I think it makes it more complicated than a lot of Amazonian places. So it's, it's you know, I, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's similarities and difference. I mean, obviously, every, every situation is very unique, but I think they are um, particularly unique for, for a variety of reasons. Yeah, actually, I 
actually have a similar question. Um, so I was sort of struck by how um, cooperative the Path to Show were, sort of this, these kind of state led development projects. And I think that's um, not always the case with indigenous groups, certainly across South America, right? I think in Peru, in particular, there are divisions between indigenous groups in terms of who, um, which groups really want to preserve sort of local autonomy and which ones that really want to engage with these sort of development processes with the states. Um, and so I'm sort of also wondering about like what the story looks like also within Brazil, like, uh, how many how much indigenous groups actually cooperate with these development processes and if we're seeing some tension around sort of the extractivist model development or something like that. I think, I think for the for the Brazil context, I think there, there's a you know, I think there, there's a lot of reaction there. There are in cases where people kind of are actively resistant and kind of refuse to participate in these sorts of things or, or participate in projects depending on who 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 the other partners or the funding sources that are involved. I think that happens. In, in, in the local case, I mean, I, you know, I, I glossed over a, a very complicated process with very heterogeneous communities, uh, with lots of competing with different interests. There's, you know, political factions, there's groups of, um, you know, a lot of them tied to sort of kinship groups and, and family relationships. Uh, there's a lot of difference, you know, there's differences between men and women and how, you know, this respect activities they engage in and sort of their environmental knowledge and their perspectives on the environment. Uh, you have uh, groups that have, you know, if you're engaged in, in craft production, you more likely have a different perspective than somebody that's mainly agriculture. Also, the type of craft production, you're going to have a different perspective. You know, if you do a wood-based craft production or if you do the highly mechanized form of craft production, you're going to have perspective on all of this. And so uh, there hasn't been unanimous support for all these projects. And oftentimes when these projects start, there's a lot of there's a sort of a lot of infighting and a lot of pushback uh, either to step back from the project or at least change you know the scope of the projects. Uh, so that, that that's a really important dynamic here. And, and so there's there's this there's one faction well there's there's some folks types of craft production that are very resistant to this relationship with environmental uh, organizations. And then there's another group that's not already tied to craft production, uh, but that is sort of like the more radical wing of the Batashaw, that's what the, the, the Frenti is the Batashaw, who have been had sort of a more of an ideological position against all, most of these sorts of projects. They see this continue to see this as an attempt by the state to co-op them, to sort of, you know, buy them off so that they won't push for the land rights. Uh, and so that, that is a really important dynamic and something that I, I, I didn't go into detail, but, but, it's, but it's really important to understand what's, what's going on. Um, my knowledge of the Petra show is probably not accurate enough, but I do remember about 10 or 12 years ago, great alarm over the Petra show because so many of the young people Suicide. Um, and that had something to do with this failure to get recognition, people saying they're not really an indigenous people. Um, so, could you just trace briefly you know, what the trajectory was? When did some of these changes in uh, trying to negotiate with the Patisha may have come in because of this? I mean, what I remember was sort of a big movement of people around the world to call attention to the plight of the Patisha. Um, around those kinds of issues. Yeah, so, um, so there's the area you, you're probably speaking of is there, so there's two. That's what I was afraid of. We were talking about two different there's, groups. There's two Patasha groups. One, one is the Patasha and the other one is the Patasha Hanahain. And the Patasha Hanahain are, uh, they, I mean, they, they, there's sort of movement of people back and forth from these communities and they're sort of together, work together on sort of, uh, you know, on sort of advocacy work around land issues in the area. Um, but it's a slightly different group and different history. Um, the Batashal Hanahain are in the cacao growing regions where the, the sort of violence related to land conflict has been much more intense. Okay. Has, That's has, really has a longer history of being, uh, you know, a very violent conflict with, you know, cacao uh, used to be kind of dominate the region and it's very lucrative. Uh, and there was uh, there's 
there's a long history of, of conflict there that uh, the dynamics are a little bit different. Uh, but this issue of, of the authenticity always uh, plays a role in, in what's going on at the local level for both these groups. And I think more generally Indians of the northeast of Brazil. Um, mm -hmm. There's a sense that these are fake Indians, they're just yeah. pretending to be Indians. Um, in the case of the Patasho, the, the tourism component complicates this dynamic even more because it's just sort of performance of indigeneity for to, for tourists uh, that sort of reinforces this idea that they're just they're not really Indians, they're fake Indians. And so just you know in terms of concrete examples, there's there's a lot of tension between I mean, not surprisingly, the areas where the Bakasha are are also areas where uh, MST settlements happen. Um, you know, because there are more remote areas and it's less less valuable than in other areas, less accessible. Um, so there's there's MST settlements in the areas. But so there's a lot of tension between these these two groups, um, and some of some of that dynamic plays out in MST's folks in the world. Why, why should you guys have special rights and not us, right? You guys are, are just like us, you're just rural farmers, right? You're, you, you don't have any special claims to the and your special rights within, within the law. And so that that plays out in some of the legal battles around um, land claims. So there is, I, I didn't talk about this, but there's another Batashar reservation uh, territory uh, close to the one where I worked, which was just, uh, demarcated last year, uh, and there's been a, a history of kind of violent conflict between those two groups there. Uh, and then when, 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 it actually, when it was demarcated last year, uh, there, you know, even when once it gets demarcated, the, the, the story is not done, right? There's still legal processes that can push back on, on, on the boundaries. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question. It fills in a lot of information. <laughs> So we'll have to leave it there actually, but if you have any more questions, hopefully you can chat with Gustavo um, right now. And yeah, thanks again. <laughs>